I was intending to skip over some areas that I didn't think you would be interested in to be taught on, but that would be necessary to be in a book like we have, Every Wind of Doctrine. One of the bodies said, are you going to teach on some of these areas that we're going to look at tonight? And I said, well, I was purposely skipping over them. Well, he said, that's exactly what we need because we're running into these things among college students. So tonight, the Baha'ism and Zen Buddhism and Transcendental Meditation, those things are almost as American now as McDonald's. Maybe that's not a good comparison, but almost as American as apple pie and ice cream. Everyone just accepts these as normal forms of westernized practices. The reason that Baha'ism is so significant for Christians to know something about today is because so many college students are embracing these things, and you'll find Baha'i clubs on college campuses all over the United States. Now, the Baha'i faith is actually an importation from Persia, or old Persia, it'd be Iran today, the nation of Iran, which of course is Mohammedan. It originated in Persia in the last century. It's a foreign religious cult imported into the United States, and now it's spread all over the world. The reason it's so popular, it teaches the essential unity of all religions. They're all one, they're all from God. We should not be separate. Whether we're a Christian or a Jew or a Buddhist or a Hindu or whatever, they stress the essential unity of all religions as being from one source, God, and the brotherhood of man. And of course, uh, that's the world's philosophy. The brotherhood of man, fatherhood of God are stressed by the liberals and modernists and the cults. And of course, the Bible teaches just the contrary. He's only the father of his children who are born again by faith in Christ. And men are not brothers except in the natural sense. They are not spiritual brothers unless they're in Christ. Satan's purpose is in teaching the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God is to break down the need of redemption and the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. We're all children of God and we're all brothers. The founder of Baha'ism was a man, I won't give you the... Uh, Islamic names because they're always something like Effendi or Abdul, thus and so. But he came to call himself, designate himself in 1844 as Bab, B-A-B, which means in Arabic, gate or door. Of course, you know Jesus called himself the door. This is the 19th century we're talking about when this happened, and Many of the ideas and concepts you see they could get from reading the Old Testament and the Bible because Mohammedans do respect the Old Testament and treat Jesus, consider him to be a prophet. So he designated himself as the door, Bab in Arabic meaning door, and said he was like John the Baptist, the forerunner for the promised Messiah who was to come, the great end time prophet who would be the promised one or the Messiah. Now, the Bab was executed shortly after that because the Mohammedans, I guess you know most of the Near Eastern world is Islamic or Mohammedan, worshiping God as Allah and treating Jesus as only a prophet and teacher. And so the Mohammedans saw Baha'ism as a threat to Mohammedanism, so they executed him and killed many of his followers. And then his successor who came along and called himself, and this is where they get the name of it, Baha'u'llah, which means glory of God, and he declared that he was the promised one, the Messiah, the divine manifestation of God. He was the last prophet to come. In fact, he was God. He was the manifestation of God. And he's the one, of course, who taught the essential unity of all religions and that the brotherhood of man, the time for the union of all men as brothers had now come. Of course, among unregenerate men, these things find a ready ear. Well, God died in 1892 after 40 years of imprisonment and exile, and then his eldest son took his place and continued his teachings. He was the sole interpreter of the writings of Baha'u'llah. He came to America in the early part of this century, made a number of disciples in Chicago. And by the way, the headquarters for Baha'ism is in Illinois, right here next to us. So you ought to know something about it since it's so close to home. 
One of the most famous disciples that he made was President Woodrow Wilson's daughter at that time. He was president. And that isn't strange seeing as is reported that Woodrow Wilson himself was involved in spiritualism. And you may be a little uh, surprised, I don't know, to learn that uh, many of your presidents and government leaders are involved in the occult. Lincoln held seances in the White House. His wife died in an insane institution, which is often common with those who dabble in the occult. Several of the presidents have sought the advice and counsel of the contemporary sorceress and false prophetess, Jean Dixon. And so it isn't strange to see, perhaps, that Woodrow Wilson's daughter was one of the first converts to Baha'ism in America. Now, there are numerous Baha'i temples and centers throughout the United States, and they have a large one over in Wilmette, Illinois, with nine great gates and entrances. I don't know how many millions of dollars spent on that, and the nine doors are said to represent the unity of all religions, and nine being the number of perfection. The Baha'is hold not church services. They don't have a clergy, but they have teachers who hold discussions of their teachings in homes and in centers, Baha'i centers. Just a word about their teachings, because this is the most significant thing we want to remember. First of all, they look upon God as Christian science does, as Mohammedans do, as the uh, theosophy cult and some of the others, the modernists, as being pantheistic, that God is not a personal God, that uh, he is uh, equated, actually, to the Baha'is. He's equated with nature itself. Of course, on each of the errors of these cults, we just give you a few scriptures and refutation. That God is to be equated with nature, and he is not triune. That is, he's not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, in 2 Corinthians 13, 14... We refer to the scriptures, of course, in refutation to the teachings of the cults. If we can find scripture where the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are mentioned together in one verse or one passage, then it refutes their error without having to say any more about it. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the Son, and the love of God, that's the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. So in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit mentioned. And so God is triune. We've already given you much discussion and teaching on this under Christian science and the Herbert W. Armstrong's cult, both denying, for example, the triunity of God. Generally, the cults deny the triunity of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We showed you last time Luke 3, 21 and 22, where Jesus being baptized, the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove, and the Father's voice came out of heaven saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. So there you have Jesus being baptized, the Holy Spirit descending upon him, and the Father speaking out of heaven. If that isn't triunity of God, I don't know what is. And of course, the personality of God. Personality of God is set forth in many scriptures such as Matthew 6 where in verse 9 Jesus says to pray to our Father which art in heaven. So he is a personal God. As concerns Jesus Christ, you would expect them to say, as the Mohammedans do, that Jesus is not unique. They admit, as all Mohammedans do, and of course the Baha'is are not Mohammedans. That's just their background. They came from Persia where Mohammedism is entrenched. But that Jesus Christ, they admit, is a prophet, but he's not unique because he's just one of the prophets that God has sent into the world at many times in our history to preach and prophesy to that particular generation, whatever their needs were. Christ was the prophet to the Christians, like Moses was the prophet to the Jews, and Mohammed the prophet to the Arabs, Confucius and Buddha prophets to the Chinese, and so on. But that he's not unique. Baha'u'llah is the last prophet that God was to send into the world. And he has the last revelation. He's the last prophet. Now, refutation to the fact that Jesus is not unique, 
and the Baha'u'llah was the last prophet, we have, for example, John 10, verses 7 to 9. Now, of course, in the book, I give you a lot more than we try to set forth here in our study. I just introduce you to the main aspects of these things. But Jesus, listen to what he says. Now, all the cults, you see, deny that he is unique, son of God, or that he is very God. They deny these things. They say that all religions are but different paths to the same goal and that there are many Christs and many prophets, and that Christ, Jesus, is just one Christ, Messiah sent to his generation, and that there have been Christs before him. Moses was a Christ, and Zoroaster to the Persians was a Christ, and Mohammed was a Christ, and Buddha was a Christ, because Christ just means the anointed one in Hebrew, you see. They were all anointed, sent by God into the world to speak to their generation. But you know, when Jesus came, And I don't say like some people do in their books that he was either a deceiver or he's telling the truth. I can't even utter those words. They try to make a point that way, you know. They try to say, well, let's look at the scripture and the scriptures declare Jesus to be unique and divine and so he was either the greatest deceiver or he's telling the truth. Well, I never could bring myself to say it that way. I don't think you have to prove the fact that he's unique by uh, either or. But the point is that he did come claiming he was the only one, he was the only Christ, that any who came before him were thieves and robbers, and any who would come after him were deceivers. John 10, then said Jesus, verse 7, Verily, verily, I say to you, I am the bab, B-A-B, if you want to say it in Arabic, I am the door of the sheep. And all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep did not hear them. He goes on in this chapter to tell the Pharisees and those who reject him, the reason you don't believe is because you're not one of my sheep. But he says, my sheep always hear my voice through the gospel and respond to it. So he said, the sheep didn't hear those who were not the true Messiah. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief, and that's anybody who claims to be something isn't like the Bab and the Baha'u'llah. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that's a hireling and is not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Hallelujah. Well, we could go on reading profitably the rest of John 10, but I want to get over to Matthew 24. He said all that came before him and claimed to be Messiah or sent of God to deliver were thieves and robbers. Now he says in Matthew 24 to his disciples, to his sheep just before he leaves them, that anyone that will come after him, after he leaves and claims to be Christ or Messiah, are sent from God as deliverer, then he is a deceiver. Verse 4, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. That's exactly what Baha'u'llah did. You see, he said, I am the last prophet. And all the religions have some Messiah. Theosophy had the divine incarnation of God. He finally retired and went off into retirement somewhere. He got tired being the Messiah. (laughs) Madame Blavatsky, who founded Theosophy, her successor found a... Uh, it's strange, they always get somebody out of India or somewhere out of the East, you know, that seems kind of mystical, I guess, and declared him to be the promised one. But he finally got tired of all the worship and retired from that job here a few years ago. But he says, in verse 5, many will come in his name and say that they're Christ. That means down through history since Jesus' time, we've had them. But he says many will come, so there will be deceivers in the last day, and unless we are taught what to look for and what to expect, we could be deceived. That's the point. He says, take heed that no man deceive you. If we didn't have to be warned, why would he say that? And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things shall come to pass, but the end is not yet, and so on. Verse 5, he says that they will deceive many. 
Not a few, but many are going to be deceived by the false Christ. And so for the Baha'is to say that Jesus is not unique and he's just one prophet among many and that he was his prophet to his generation and now Baha'u'llah is the prophet, the last prophet to come, why Jesus himself refutes that. Of course, Philippians 2, which we've already read in connection with the other cults, Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11, tells us that Jesus was and is God. Then the atonement, we're told by the Baha'is that Christ's death was not a sacrificial atonement for sinners. It's no more significant than Bab's death. You know, the forerunner of Baha'u'llah, Bab, who said, I'm the door, the gate, and the forerunner announcing the coming of the Messiah. Baha'is say that Jesus' death was no more significant than the Bab's. The Bab was martyred. They say Jesus was martyred. Now, they hold Jesus in high regard as a prophet, but only a man who was a prophet. And his death, of course, though, we're told, is no more significant than any religious martyr in history. His death is not a sacrifice for sinners. Sin is but an imperfection. And if we teach people not to sin, then sin will be eliminated. Well, of course, we have in refutation to that some of these things we've answered on other tapes, so I won't take a lot of time. Uh, about the atonement, Hebrews chapters 9 and 10 show that the blood atonement, that Jesus' death was a blood atonement. Matthew 20, 28, he says he's giving his life a ransom for many. In John 1, 29, we're told that he's the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. Not only is sin very real and has to be dealt with by God, but Jesus was the one sent in the world to remove sin. We're saved by faith in that atonement, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Again, Baha'is teach, you'll find this in their literature if you uh, ever run across any of it, uh, the Baha'is teach that the scriptures are not inspired and not infallible that the writings of Baha'u'llah are the last revelation given to the world, and they are the scriptures that we're to follow. Now, of course, he wrote several things, and uh, the Baha'is study these in their meetings. Well, in answer to that, of course, we've already given you 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, says all scripture is God-breathed. That's what the Greek says. doesn't use the word inspired. Certainly they're inspired if they're God-breathed. It says that God has breathed out all scripture, and certainly that makes it infallible. But I like a passage where people generally never look at some of the places I look to find answers to errors, and that's John 4, 19 to 22. The books on theology will give you 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 to prove the Bible's inspired, but, you know, just by reading the Bible, you find many statements that prove a point that the theology is often overlooked. But John 4, he's talking to the woman at the well. She said, Sir, verse 19, I perceive you're a prophet. She said that because he just had a word of knowledge concerning her and told her about her past. She said, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship you know not what. Now he's talking to a half Jew. Samaritan is half Gentile, half Jew. They lived right there in Palestine. Samaritan means they were in Samaria. And so they knew the Old Testament. And she's saying to him, our fathers say we should worship here in Samaria. They had a temple there on the mount. But she said, you Jews say you must worship God in Jerusalem. Jesus answered, the hour is coming when true worshipers shall worship the Father in truth and in spirit. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. But what I want to call to your attention, he told her she did not know, verse 22, what she was worshiping. He says, we Jews know whom we're worshiping for salvation comes through the Jews. Which we're answering the Baha'i contention that the scriptures are not inspired and that salvation is coming through their revelations, through Baha'u'llah and their scriptures. But Jesus said that only the Jew has the revelation. 
He said, salvation comes for the Jews. Says the rest of you, even though you're a half Jew, he said, you don't know what you're worshiping. But he says, we know what we're worshiping. Then if you turn over to Romans 3, another confirmation that often the theologies overlook such obvious statements of the fact that there's only one way of salvation and only one set of scriptures. Romans chapter 3. What advantage then has the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that into them were committed the oracles of God. In other words, it's the same thing as Jesus saying that salvation is going to come through Jews. Not only that Jesus was a Jewish Messiah, but the fact that the Jews alone were entrusted with the true revelation. Nobody else had it. I don't mean they had some error and some truth. I mean the only truth came through the Jews. Anything else has been perverted. Romans 1 says any revelation they got, they perverted. And instead of seeing God, they saw his creation, started to worship it. This is what man will always do. The unregenerate mind will always do with what he sees. The point being that while other cults and religions claim to have revelation are sometimes like Baha'ism have the true revelation the word of God itself says that only the Jew has the true revelation one of the Psalms clearly declares that only to Israel only Israel received the revelation of God it makes a plain statement that fact he said I have not revealed these things to any other nation only to you so God himself says that in the Old Testament so the scriptures that we have, of course, we take it by faith, naturally. Anyone who can't take the scriptures by faith isn't going to take Christ by faith. I got a letter recently from a fellow on a lot of proof texts, manuscript evidence. He said, I don't need it, but I've got some intellectual friends. If I can convince them with argument that look at the glory of God will get in their salvation. Well, I wrote him back. You can't argue people into the faith. And the miracles, the supernatural, and the inspiration of scriptures are not subject to rational proof. It's a matter of faith. It really is, friends. You start studying manuscript evidence right away, you better start with faith because the seminaries will talk you out of what little you got. I thank God I had it before I went to seminary because by the time they get done with the Bible, most students were just shaking all to pieces because the average person hasn't thought. They think somehow these 66 books were just dropped out of heaven, you know, supernaturally and planted there at Moses and Paul's feet. Said, now bind these in a book. But there were scores and scores of books that claimed to be scripture. How did we end up with 66? Take it by faith. Amen. I just somehow believe God, who's big enough to create the universe, could see that the right 66 got in here. Matter of faith. I've had all the courses and the arguments, and I still take it by faith that every jot and every tittle is inspired of the Lord. I didn't say the King James translation or your Phillips or whatever you use. But the original manuscripts inspired by God, and he saw to it that the right ones got in here. Well, when you go into deeper study, it's interesting how we got our Bible, how we got it, how we put it together. But as I say, it was Israel and the church that determined what books were to be here for us. You either take it by faith or you don't. A book by its own testimony tells you whether it's inspired or not. I can uh, let you read some of the apocryphal books that didn't get in. You can see the difference right away in most of them. Plus the fact that they're historical inaccuracies. And there's never been a single error ever proven about this book, you see. But you can find inaccuracies in some of the others that claim to be scripture. There are a lot of tests. It would be an interesting study for those of us who study that, Lord willing. The scriptures I told this brother, like miracles, supernatural, like God himself is not subject to rational proof. God doesn't prove himself. He just starts out, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God. You either believe it or you don't. Believing it is salvation. I can't understand Christians who need proofs of that which isn't subject to proof. See, everything is by faith. Everything. Salvation right on, up or down, by faith. And people are just wasting their time trying to debate or argue with those who come along with some sort of manuscript evidence about this and that and the other and try to prove to them that God exists, sun shining. <laughs> then eternal punishment, they deny, of course. They teach that there is a punishment, but it's remedial. That is, it will bring the erring ones to repentance. 
We've given you the scriptures many times on this. We mention them again for completeness sake, though, that the Bible plainly teaches us that if there's a heaven, there's a hell. In Matthew 25, 46, the same verse teaches both places. You can't have a heaven without a hell because Matthew 25, 46 teaches both. Mark 9, 43 to 48, remember Jesus said, it's eternal punishment, the fire is not quenched, the worm does not die. Revelation 14, Revelation 19, Revelation 20 clearly teach a literal place of eternal punishment. Then in the sixth place, the Baha'is say that Christianity is just a passing religion that has served its day, its need is already passed, and Baha'u'llah has come to announce uh, that the new age has come, that all religions are now to unite, whether Hindu, Buddhist, Jew, Christian, whatever, are to unite into one great religious brotherhood and that uh, we are to work for the brotherhood of all men throughout the earth and bring peace because the final message that God has given to our age before the world ends and it came through Baha'u'llah that we should work for peace and for unity and for brotherhood. Well, it's interesting again that Jesus said that there would be no peace. In Matthew 24, he said there'd be wars and rumors of wars. I recommend you read Matthew 24 after listening to what Baha'is say about peace is going to come on earth. Jesus said it wouldn't. And I like the passage especially. In addition to Matthew 24, in Matthew 10, where Jesus, on the contrary, said he had not come to bring peace, but a sword. He says in verse 34, Matthew 10, Think not that I've come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. You're wasting your time working for peace in this <coughs> sinful lost world. Bring men to Christ. Teach them that there is no peace apart from the coming of the Prince of Peace. There be none. Amen. Read Matthew 24 in light of Matthew 10:34. For he said, I have come to set a man at variance against his own father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemy shall be they of his own household. Now you say, well, I don't understand that. I thought he came to, you know, to unite and to bind up and to bring peace. Well, if you don't understand that, you read all that he said in the four Gospels, and I guarantee you'll understand it. That's right. Why should I stop and teach you what the Lord wants you to see for yourself out of his word? Because he did not come to send peace. And there's no point in standing here and, and giving you proof texts to prove that he didn't. Because if you've ever been in a true church, you'll find out that those who get the word and go out, they don't have peace. You get the baptism of the Holy Ghost and go home and talk about it, you hear of divorce proceedings threatened even just because the wife's or husband speaks in tongues. So there's no peace contrary to Baha'is. There's no peace to come until Jesus comes as Prince of Peace and sets up his kingdom. No, he said things will get worse before they get better. And I think you can look about you and see they're getting worse. Now the black Muslims... Let me uh, take just a moment here to give you a little free education because there's a lot of confusion over certain terms. Muslim and a Muslim and an Islam and a Mohammedan are all the same thing. The word Muslim and Muslim are really two spellings the same thing. So Muslim, Muslim, Islam all mean surrendered. To what Mohammedanism so they're really Arabic words which mean the same as this they are surrendered yielded consecrated to Mohammedanism because as you read and you see in our new book in many of the areas where you run into Mohammedanism and so forth these terms are interchangeable you'll say the Islamic religion you mean a Mohammedan a Muslim is a Muslim, and a Muslim is an Islamic, and so forth. I'm just assuming you know what Mohammedanism is. A large percentage of the world are Mohammedans. So if you don't know, go home and look it up in the dictionary, what it's all about, or an encyclopedia. I mean, 
I think God expects Christians to be a little bit knowledgeable that a great percentage of the world are Buddhists and Mohammedans. There are a lot less Christians than these other two we just mentioned. I think we'll know a little bit about them. And Mohammedanism almost conquered the world during the 8th century A.D., 7th and 8th century. It's a Near Eastern religion way over there in Arabia and Persia and those areas. It spread all the way up into Spain. These terms, I say, are interchangeable, so whenever we say one or the other, that's what we mean. Now, Mohammedan is one, of course, who worships Allah as God, prays three times a day toward Mecca, where Mohammed was born. Mohammed arose several centuries after Christ and claimed to have received a great revelation, and he did get a revelation, no doubt, called the Koran, which are the Mohammedan scriptures, and they're on an equal status with the Holy Bible. In fact, they supersede it to a Mohammedan. I mean, they're on equal status in their thinking. They do respect our scriptures because they consider Moses and Jesus prophets, like Mohammed was a prophet. We had the privilege of leading some Mohammedans to Christ back in 1966 when we were in old Jerusalem. One of the young men said, well, Mohammed is our prophet, Jesus is your prophet. And he said, I don't see why I should give up my prophet to accept your prophet. Well, I said, the only difference is yours is dead. <laughs> he didn't have any answer for that. He didn't ask me to prove that mine was alive, but I gave him the proof. I said, if you receive him into your heart, you'll find out he's alive. I said, I'll guarantee you, I'll guarantee you that he'll prove he's alive if you receive him first. He was wanting to get some big answer. He went to Muhammad in the mosque and prayed to Allah and they got no answer. He went to the tomb, resurrection tomb, said, you know, he didn't want to miss any options. Prayed to Jesus to give him peace in his heart and to answer prayer and said, didn't get the answer either place. Well, I said, you're trying to get an answer before you're his child. I said, you receive him into your heart by faith and you'll get your answer. Seven o'clock the next morning, phone was ringing. It says, it's real. Everything is different. The world's different. Jerusalem's different. Oh, it says it's happened. Jesus is in my heart. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he went on to say, to receive your Christ would mean my life if my family finds out about it. He said, a lot of new Christians are killed when they leave Mohammedanism. Now, that's just how important it is. And, of course... Israel is God's calendar and all that happens to us, we have to keep our eyes on Israel. And here's what is surrounding the Israelites, the Egyptians, the Arabs, all those Arab nations. It's Mohammedans that are fighting the Jews. These are the ones that God is going to deal with in these last days. We're not dealing with something, you know, way off somewhere. It's very current. Well, the black Muslims are significant to us because it's a strictly an American religious cult. It's a black nationalist religious movement in the United States also calls itself the Nation of Islam. Now we're back to that word, you know, Islam again. The nation of Islam, all these terms are interchangeable. It was founded in 1930 in Detroit, again right close to us, fairly recent, by Wally Farad, F-A-R-A-D, Wally Farad, colored man who was considered to be a prophet by his disciples and what he sought to do was to establish a separate identity for the Negro whom he claimed to be descendants of a lost Mohammedan tribe of course it's convenient they're always lost like Armstrong these ten lost tribes <laughs> Ten lost tribes of Israel. But he says the Negroes don't really come from Africa, but they are really descendants of a lost Muslim tribe. And that's why they call themselves the Black Muslims. And his followers, and still today, and they're quite militant and powerful, his followers accept the Mohammedan religion. They have a large following here in the United States. A disciple of the black Muslims are required to accept Mohammedanism and reject Christianity. Why? It's a white man's religion. Well, of course, uh, you wouldn't say a Jew was uh, not white, I suppose. 
It's certainly not peculiar to what they're thinking, you know, Caucasian in the sense that it was invented by somebody over here in the States or something, but Jesus is the founder of Christianity, a Jew. But anyway, they have to renounce Christianity, except Mohammedanism, and they have to renounce their Christian names, which are, again, white man slave names, and adopt names which are Arabic or Islamic. And this may spark a little bit of recall to you. Who is the most outstanding Muslim, black Muslim in America? Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay. He gave up his slave name. Of course, they make a lot to do about slave names and white man's religion and so forth. So they had to give up Christianity. They have to give up their white names given to them by white men, they say. And thirdly, they have to avoid all contact, insofar as possible, contact with fellowship with white people. So you can see they constitute quite a religious threat in the United States. They're waiting for the Battle of Armageddon, which will be the last battle to be fought worldwide when the Negroes will triumph over the whites. Farad disappeared in 1934. We don't know what happened to him, where he <laughs> decided he didn't want to be a prophet any longer like some of these others or whether he died like Baha'u'llah, God, died over in Persia, or whether he was killed. But the headquarters are now in Chicago. Again, this is something right here close to home. And they've been there since 1942. When Farad disappeared, then the leadership was taken over by a man named Poole, P-O-O-L-E, whose father had moved to Detroit to work in the automobile factory, and then Poole, his son, took over the leadership. Now, they build not churches or buildings, but Mohammedan mosques. They claim to have, well, a quarter of a million followers, but they do have somewhere between 100,000, 250 Negroes. Let me hasten to add, no one can deny the Negro has been debased, exploited, and mistreated, denied his human rights, and the government should take all pains as swiftly as possible. We're saying this as Christians, not demanding anything. Christians don't demand anything. But we're saying the government ought to remedy the situation as quickly as they can. It'll take a long time, even if they wanted to. The Emancipation Proclamation didn't free the Negro at all. He's been in slavery ever since he was kidnapped from Africa and brought over here by the whites and sold in slavery. There isn't too much that we could do for them. Whatever we did wouldn't be enough. Now, if you have any need of instruction on the race question, we have two tapes on God's answer to the race question. It might help some of you who have not heard it to understand the biblical teaching on the so-called inequality of the races and the whole race question. It would surprise some of you to learn that Moses married a Negro. And God rebuked Aaron and Miriam because they didn't like it. You know, there's a whole lot in the Bible besides what some of you have been taught, whether you're from the north or the south. And we're not advocating any sort of change in social structure at all. I don't think the nigger wants any change in social structure. I don't think the Japanese or the Chinese, they want to be left alone and given equal opportunities and rights like human beings. Christians never look at colors. I mean, the Negro think that we look funny. You go over in Africa, they can't understand how you could go out in the sun as white as you are. <laughs> That's right. We are in the minority over there. When you grow up where they're all Chinese, then whatever you are, you're in the minority, you see. Go to China. It just so happens that's human nature to think because we're in the majority that we must be something special in the sight of God. But you go to Africa, you're not in the majority, and they'll let you know it right away. Well, that isn't right that they let you know it right away, but you'll find that's human nature. While we have said on the tapes many things that need to be said, in fact, when Negroes hear that, they say, where in the world did he get that? How can he understand our psychology? How can he understand how we think and feel? One Negro sister said, because the Lord showed it to them. Amen. That's right. You'd be surprised what's on those tapes. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised what the Negro wants. I'm not talking about black Muslims and black Panthers. You'd be surprised. He doesn't want you to give him a thing. That is condescending. That's putting him right back to where he was, you see.
The government owes him. We owe him. But that isn't what he's looking for. He wants just to be a human being with all the equal opportunities and rights that you have. And that's what God expects that we're to give him. On that tape is related two visions God gave me, how that uh, we're reaping some of the things that have been sown. When I say we, I'm going to say it. I don't care what anybody thinks about it. I don't mean me. I say we, I mean the white race. Because I've always loved the Negro. I've always loved the Jew. I've never thought he was unequal. Biologically, spiritually, in every other way, he is the same. In fact, Acts 17, verse 26 settles the race question. God has made of one blood all men which dwell upon the face of the earth. You've got Eskimo in you. You may not like Eskimos. You've got pygmy blood in you. You may not like it. Better just accept it and live with it. It's scripture. We all go back to Adam. In fact, we all go back to Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. There you are. You can't change that fact. And uh, any way you make it, you're going to have to make one of Noah's sons a Negro if you're going to try to, you know, to say, well, it had to start somewhere. It didn't start anywhere. It starts with Adam. Where did the Chinese start? Where did the pygmies start? Where did you start? Where did the Eskimos start? Adam and Eve. We we'll all come, God says, out of the same womb, and we are of the same blood. When I say we, I really don't mean me because uh, I have a real love and compassion for the undertrodden of any kind and uh, I've just had no trouble trying to love the Negro or to love the Jew. I just do. I asked a Negro brother once, uh, I said, why is it that when I try to be friendly with Negroes, they won't let me? He said, have you been burned once? Well, he didn't have to say anymore. They don't trust us. That was in my unregenerate days. I loved the men. I didn't have to try then. Well, you want to know where I was working when I said that? In a liquor store. <laughs> didn't think I ever did that, huh? Thought I was born with all of this faith and righteousness. <laughs> Hanging over the counter, talking to my black brother. Of course, he and I got along okay, but usual Negro, you know, they're, they're wary of you. And he said, well, if you've been burned once, and the white man has burned him. But uh, you ought to hear the tapes, and you'll find out that there's a whole lot that maybe you don't know about the whole race question. Don't say, look, I feel sorry for you. I want to give you something. That is condescending. He'll turn you off just as quick as not giving him anything. He doesn't want your sympathy. He wants dignity as a human being. And that's what God showed in vision, as we show on the tapes. While we know this, that we couldn't do enough for them because the white man is guilty of all of his problems and his oppression, and not just the Negro, we can get off on the Indian friends. We took it away from them. This isn't your ground here. No, it isn't. It doesn't belong to you. You're here by God's grace. Oh, you say they were savages. Well... <laughs> What were you before you were born again? <laughs> Just a cultured savage, educated savage. Some of you weren't either of those. <laughs> That's right. You might have just been an uneducated alcoholic savage or something. So we were all in the same gutter is what I'm saying. No, I don't find any divine mandate to go take America away from the Indians. There are a lot of people that are concerned about the Indians stuck off on some land that a white man couldn't live on a week out west in a dust bowl. Uh, we owe the Indian a lot. You see my position, so you know that what I'm going to say next, I have no animosity. But the black Muslim movement is not the way to get the rights they need. It is just a black repetition of all the errors of the white man. Because they are racist, they're filled with hatred, and discrimination against the whites. And so that's just a black repetition of the mistakes we've made. So you don't help the problem through black Muslims, you only increase it. It is a religious cult. Now I mentioned just briefly the Black Panthers because there's a tendency to confuse the two and they're not the same at all. The Black Panthers are not a religious cult 
but they are a terrorist cult. The FBI said they're the most dangerous, violent group in the United States. Black Panthers organized in California in 1966, another new movement by Huey P. Newton and Bobby G. Seale, both revolutionary black nationalists who demand a separate black nation like an Indian reservation? No, they don't say that, but they want, you know, like the state of Georgia, the state of New York, just to establish another black nation. They said, we didn't ask to come over here. And you owe us this. They demand reparations for all the white exploitation of the blacks, millions of dollars, two, three, four hundred million, whatever it is, in reparations. That wouldn't pay back what we owe them, so they might as well ask for all of it or none. They demand the Black Panthers that they be allowed to organize their own police system, their own courts, carry their own guns to protect themselves from white harassment. They demand they have their own schools, their own laws, their own state, and that they be exempt from all draft into the Army of the United States. Well, they're not a large group, thank the Lord. They're very small, but they do represent black power and they're forced to be reckoned with by the authorities. They have been charged with plotting attempts to bomb public institutions and kill the police. And they are a terrorist cult, not a religious. So we mentioned those in our new book together because of the tendency to confusion. But they're in the news all the time, and so you need to know this is a part of the end time satanic flood launched against the human race to bring about all the confusion and judgment, of course, because of the white man's sins. Then Zen Buddhism is another foreign religion or cult, this time from China and Japan, transported into the West. It's become quite popular because of its emphasis upon transcendental meditation, which we'll tell you what that is shortly. But the cult stresses meditation as a means of gaining knowledge of God, what they would call God, the nature of your own inner self to understand yourself, and salvation. They don't speak of salvation. They call it spiritual enlightenment. But salvation will come through meditation. The Zen Buddhists are not like other types of Buddhists. The Zen Buddhists reject worship of deity. They reject the authority of Buddhist scriptures, they reject ritual, they stress meditation as a means of understanding true reality. When we say true reality, as we've taught on these cults like Christian science and so forth, they speak of reality. You know, What we mean is the question in philosophy is raised, what is really true? What is real? Is a tree really a tree or are we seeing just the image of reality? Is anything real? And what or who or where is God and all this? So they say through meditation you can come into an awareness of true reality, that your spirit becomes enlightened as to the nature of God or the one that we would call God. You're liberated from all the confusion and chaos of the contemporary world. And that's why it became so popular among the beatniks and then later the hippies who followed the beatniks because, you see, Zen Buddhism stresses uh, meditation as a means to enlightenment, and so it seemed to conform to the hippie lifestyle, you know, of nonconformity, of uh, lack of moral and social responsibility, living a life of self-indulgence, rejection of authority, and certainly in Zen Buddhism they found this. Now, we're told by the Zen Buddhists that you can find truth through meditating. That truth is not something outside yourself, but as you meditate, you come to an inner awareness of what truth is, and man really, through meditation, transcendental meditation, can see within himself and within the cosmos or universe, and he will find truth within himself. Now the only problem with that is the scriptures say that man can't find any truth except outside himself. And he doesn't find it by searching. Canst thou by searching find out God? The book of Job. No, 
Revelation always comes to us of God and truth from outside. In fact, it comes unsought. God has revealed himself to man. Without the revelation, then man would remain in darkness. So the sinner cannot meditate and look within himself and find truth. And there's much of this sort of meditation going on. I mean by the tens of thousands, the whole younger generation, the drug scene, the hippies, they're all caught up in this idea of meditation. And in the churches and many of the ministers who are getting involved in the occult. When I went to Israel in 66, I had a Methodist minister there and I knew there was something wrong with him. Really did, I mean odd. Spiritually odd, because he came into the room one time, and I was kneeling praying, and he says, do you always kneel when you pray? I thought everybody, did. not that I always do it that way, but <laughs> pray standing up, sitting down, but why well, I said yes. I said, I guess everybody in the church does, you know, and he couldn't get over that. A minister, I thought it was odd he would even ask. When we would pray, you know, instead of him praying, he would go off and meditate. Don't you pray? No. He said, I'm beyond prayer, I meditate. When we were going up the Bosphorus Strait toward the Black Sea, he went to the bow of the ship and he meditated the whole time. And I knew there was something occult about that, something strange. Later when I got back, I found out he was involved with Edgar Cayce and Spiritual Frontiers Fellowship and Spiritualism and has it right in his church. Has seances, ESP teachings and psychic things. The fact that he's getting away with it is a bigger mystery than the fact that he's involved in it. But this shows where the churches have degenerated to today. But see, a sinner can't meditate and find truth. He can't find it within himself because the Bible says that, that his heart is corrupt, desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9, he says the heart is desperately wicked. And who can know it? And in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, we're told that the natural man can't understand the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and following, you find that man doesn't find truth by searching because as soon as he starts to search, instead of seeing God, he imagines idols. Always, invariably, he turns the creature into the creator and begins to worship the creation. That's the significance of Romans 1, that he can't look anywhere but to the revelation that's God given for truth. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 tells us that Satan, as the God of this world, has blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest they should receive the glorious light of the gospel of Christ and be converted. And of course, Zen Buddhists reject salvation through the blood atonement. That ought to be obvious. Salvation comes through meditation, spiritual enlightenment, whereby by putting yourself under a form of self-hypnosis or self-hypnotic trance, you eventually achieve certain stages uh, as in yoga and transcendental meditation, you get to a place where you achieve what is called the Buddha mind or nirvana, N-I-R-V-A-N-A, -A, which is supposed to be a state of supreme bliss where you're above everything, all suffering, all desire, all passion. Uh, meditation, just like an LSD trip. Actually, this is a significant thing. The transcendental meditation is actually now competing for the allegiance of the drug addicts. Because you see, what happens in transcendental meditation, you put yourself into a trance through self-hypnosis. That's what the meditation does. And you receive the same revelations from the wrong source. They think they're getting them from God as you do on an LSD trip. In fact, they compare it to LSD tripping, but without the bad after effects or the chances of a bad trip. And they say it, even, it is even superior to an LSD trip, transcendental meditation. So those who use drugs, just like those who practice transcendental meditation, are actually in contact with the powers of darkness. See, what you do on drugs, as in transcendental meditation, when you put yourself into this trance, you uh, empty yourself of the independent exercise of your willpower. This opens the innermost recesses of your being to the invasion of dark spiritual forces which began to control and influence. Then when you come off the trip, you see you've got the spirits doing the talking. You think you've got a lot of light. You say, I've experienced God, and I've had things uh, 
you know, like Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, revelations that I couldn't even communicate to the human mind. And uh, they're actually finding that through transcendental meditation that people who were on drugs are getting delivered from drugs by the thousands. Because you see, a drug trip, while Satan will use that if he can, uh, there is not the advantage and control he can always have as when a person becomes a disciple and begins to sit and meditate and open himself to the invasion of these dark powers. And he becomes uh, much more usable than somebody who's always unconscious on a drug trip. And uh, actually people who use drugs, you know, they become rather uh, irresponsible in their habits. They give up employment if they have any. They uh, are unkempt, dirty. Uh, you know what goes along with it. And sometimes, of course, they lose their mind. They become uh, incoherent and inconsistent in their daily life and this sort of thing. But a person who gets caught up in Zen Buddhism and Transcendental Meditation becomes someone that is very knowledgeable, you know, about spiritual matters and the cosmos and uh, religious things. And so he becomes a tool of Satan, uh, much more effective than uh, someone who's just on drugs. What I'm saying is that Satan is actually releasing his hold on people who are on drugs when they practice transcendental meditation because it's a higher form of Satanism or the satanic influence and control of the person. He's much more valuable to Satan uh, as a religious devotee of Zen Buddhism or so forth. Now this is not some imaginary or just uh, trivial thing I'm talking about, dear friends. Universities and colleges in the U.S. government are sponsoring courses on how to practice transcendental meditation, taking your tax dollars, like $21,000 in one case that Time magazine reported, $21,000 dollars of your tax dollars to teach 150 high school teachers how to practice and teach transcendental meditation. And a lot of schools are opening themselves, their doors, to the occult teaching and transcendental meditation. It takes four one-hour lessons to learn how to get in touch with the devil, and they call it God. Harvard University is making research studies in this. Yale University teaches a full course in transcendental meditation. This is your grade academic intellectual institution that laughs at religion, and, but they're getting very spiritual in the occult, you see, transcendental meditation and so forth. And not only Yale, but we've got uh, many other universities such as the University of Colorado, Stanford University, UCLA, and others who are teaching now transcendental meditation. The government is paying people to uh, teach others, and the Army Department, these things are on record because they're recorded in encyclopedias and Time Magazine articles and so forth, all copyrighted, you can, you can be verified, what I've said here in the book. The Army Department actually recommends that its commanders teach the soldiers transcendental meditation as a possible cure of drugs from drug addiction, because it does deliver many from drugs. One guru said he not only delivered himself, but many others by teaching yoga exercises and living on a vegetarian diet, and there's your vegetarianism, vegetarianism again, Seventh-day Adventism, so forth, unity cult. <coughs> vegetarianism, like fruititarianism, is a uh, doctrine of the devil. Yes, fruititarianism is a higher stage than vegetarianism. You can't live on fruits alone, and even the devil can't get you there unless you go through certain exercises. It takes a long time, several years, to become a fruititarian, but there's some who have accomplished it. They eat nothing but fruits and practice transcendental meditation and so on. We've got, as I say, the government, colleges, universities, churches teaching transcendental meditation. And many, many people are being delivered, as I say, from drug addiction through TM, Transcendental Meditation, TM for short. What we've got is a form of self-hypnosis, of course, that gets one uh, open, his spirit open to these deceiving spirits that come in and give false revelations, impersonate God. And these people have tremendous, people who go on drug LSD trips. Now, I'm not going to deal with drugs, but I've got a whole chapter on drugs all about drugs, all you need to know, and all the bad things about it. And I even mentioned some of the 
allege good things by those who've had good trips. And they do. They get in tune with uh, forces that impersonate God himself and angels of light, 2 Corinthians 11, and give them tremendous revelations about the cosmos. And they are revelations, and some of them are true revelations, things that no man needs to know and that God has hidden. Because, you see, the devil knows a lot of things that God knows too. Remember, he was up there before he got cast down here. So through drug usage and through transcendental meditation, Satan is gathering together a great host of disciples in this last hour. Uh, 10,000 devotees a month are taking up transcendental meditation in the USA alone. 10,000 a month. I just turned the radio on. I was driving somewhere to a meeting, and there's a whole program, an hour long, on all the benefits of transcendental meditation. As you meditate, you overcome all of your worries and tensions and anxieties. That was going out over the air, millions of people hearing it. Uh, you become more creative in your job. You suddenly find out you can do more and you get raises and promotions. And the devil, you see, he will give his followers relief from tensions if he can ensnare them in some other way. And that you experience spiritual reality and you learn the truth about God, that he's not a person somewhere sitting on a throne or someone called Jesus Christ, but that God is everything and everything is God. And as you're caught up in this trance or on the LSD trip, you experience God because, well, you're God. You just suddenly come to the awareness that everything in the universe is one. That's God. Well... You wouldn't expect many people to follow error unless the devil offered them something. So he gives them good wages for a time.